Siobhan, thank you so much for, for coming on. I uh, It's been good to just chat for the last sort of 10 minutes or so. And I think we're going to get into some really cool topics around um, around not only your journey, but sort of athlete's journey in and out of out of sport. But how have you been over the recent times? I mean, it's probably been a bit of a whirlwind year for you, but how have you been recently? Um, I've been good. I've been okay. I think it's such a a hard transition I think whenever you finish sport at whatever time in your life you know whether it's on your terms whether it's not on your terms um whether you feel it's premature or whether you feel like it's sort of you know you've had the career that you've dreamed of and you've come to the end at you know a great time I think it's always really hard because it is like giving up such a huge part of your life I finished swimming and I'd say yeah, it, w- it wasn't entirely on my terms, which was a shame. But, um, you know, I feel that the, in some ways, the way I retired gave me a better perspective of everything I kind of achieved in previous years. And that actually made me feel really proud. I think you kind of always, which I was always chasing the next thing and looking to the next goal. I never really stepped back and looked at what I'd done. So I think in in some ways, the retirement gave me a perspective to think, well, actually what I achieved and, you know, despite my condition made me really proud. So that was quite a nice feeling, but then obviously I've felt a bit weird, you know, not swimming and um, yeah, not having that routine. I think that's the thing I've missed the most is having that structure to my days, you know, knowing where I had to be at what time and having that completely stripped away. And, you know, I haven't exactly found I mean I've got direction like things I want to be doing like I've got um ambitions and stuff going forward but it's not as regimented as it was like compared to you know the majority of my life being an athlete and training 30 hours a week um when that's gone it's yeah very weird you find yourself a bit lost so um there's pros and cons to retirement definitely and I feel like I've experienced both so um it's a weird feeling at the moment but I'm doing well like I, I sort of sounds a bit you know or doom and gloom but it's not I am doing really well I think it's um it's just it's just a strange time I think that's the best way to describe it is it's a strange process to go through yeah I I think I mean I resonated with your story so much and we just chatted before we came on about me ending my career through retire retiring through injury um and I think the biggest thing the word that really came around everything after when I finished and you just said it you said perspective and I think perspective is a huge thing to have as an athlete and we can get into that but the other one was identity and this sense of like who I am what has been your sort of journey over the past few months around your own identity and have you learned anything over the last few months about yourself and your whole journey career and self I have definitely and I feel that I, over probably the past, uh, I'll say that again because I'm looking at sirens. And um, <laughs> over probably the past, I'd actually say probably five, six years since Rio, I've had a huge um, learning experience about identity. Um, I think when I achieved what I did in Rio, I thought it would completely change my perception of myself um Mm. in in some ways I just uh, you know the whole build-up to Rio and um what I thought it meant to win an Olympic medal it was my dream it was my goal I lived and breathed swimming for you know 10-15 years up to that point and I achieved my goal and afterwards I just obviously things changed like external things changed and um you know I I was really lucky to have these opportunities that opened up to me and um you know I I, there were so many great things that came from that medal but it didn't change how I felt deep down and I think that that was one of the hardest things was um I then had this problem with feeling that there was a correlation in terms of externally what people thought of me because when I had the medal everyone wanted to know me I had people that didn't really um know me or speak to me before want to kind of you know uh speak to me and things like that which come with success um and then I had this thing where when I wasn't swimming so well towards probably the end of my career 
I felt that people didn't like me, which is so bizarre and so ridiculous, like when I think about it. Um, but genuinely as an athlete, you like you believe that deep down. And I didn't believe inside that the medal changed how I felt about myself. It just felt like it changed how everyone else viewed me. So there was obviously if you look at like how that's going to make you feel, there's going to be in a bit of an identity crisis there, like an, mm. in reflection, I can almost see it happening you know, when you're younger and um, I, I was at school, everyone would be like Siobhan the swimmer. And when I would go away to competitions, there was like, oh, she's away at swimming competition. I used to love that sort of thing that people saw me as Siobhan the swimmer. Um, and I associated it with being better at swimming meant I was a better person, it meant people liked me more. So then when I had that, you know, I had a period of really struggling with like post Olympic blues after Rio and struggling to find my feet, struggling to sort of, um, I don't know, adjust and also with all the health struggles that I had after Rio and not being able to perform the way I wanted, I felt like my body was letting me down. I felt like my body was letting me down. And I also felt like I was letting everyone else down and people weren't gonna like me. So if anything, the identity kind of problem that I had was whilst I was swimming, to be honest, like it really, really affected me. Um, and, and then retirement is actually in some ways given me um, a different perspective because I realized when I sort of put my messages out there and explained what had gone on people people were just so um, kind and lovely and I had so many warm messages so much support that it made me feel that I was actually more of a person than just an athlete it wasn't all about my success but up until that point I not that I didn't realize it obviously I did I know my family you know they don't care about this you know, they care about me as a person but you do, I think, as an athlete, always have this correlation from quite a young age if you're in sport that, um, you know, success reaps rewards and then people sort of, I don't know, that not that they like you more because that's ridiculous, but there is all these things that come as being an athlete and getting more successful. You know, people want to sponsor you, they want to be associated with you, you get invited to things. Mm. And, and so therefore, it's easy to see why athletes would, I think, have that perception. Um, and yeah, and, and so I think... If anything, it's been quite um, retiring. It wasn't nice, but in some ways I felt a bit um, like overwhelmed with all the kind messages that I received, which made me feel actually like, you know, it doesn't matter about my performances. Actually, people care for me as a person. And I think that was lovely. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's so much to un unpack there. But there's one thing that I saw and read and that was the, the the letter you wrote to yourself and i think it's on the uk is it in the uk sport or sport england website and it's a an amazing letter and and it was a, it was one of a series i think and that of, from other athletes but the when reading through that letter and i, I think you mentioned it at the start the the thing that came out of it for me the when, when i was reading it was this huge sense of pride that you had in yourself so you were talking about how difficult this was going to be and you're talking to your younger self about how difficult it was going to be but then at the same time just this huge amount of pride in that it gave you did, did that that was such a lovely thing to have and i i almost feel sometimes when people retire from their career because I felt it as you say like I was proud of it and and sometimes you don't mean it like you can sometimes just say it for because oh, that's the right thing to say but I think when you've gone through something that you've gone through and at the age that you've had to finish at like to say a word like that because it's so easy to say like oh, I wish you could carry on I wish you could continue I wish we could have a little bit more I hope I hope but to have pride at that age really shows how true it was I, I thought it was just a beautiful, what is a lovely letter that you wrote, um, but also just that sense of pride is just, is so important. Yeah, it is definitely. And you're right. I can, I can count on, I, I could, there's countless times that I did interviews in my career and I said, you know, I was really proud of that swim and I didn't really mean it. Um, and because you're always, when you're in the bubble, when you're still competing, I think you're quite, you're always striving for more. I think that's that's some you know that's what makes you a performer. I guess like you mm. you're never satisfied. And some of the best athletes, that's just um, their mindset and the way they you know have to the way they have to be to be able to get the best out of themselves. Like you can't sort of if you're satisfied with something, you wouldn't keep pushing. So there was lots of times in my career where 
you know, I'd say things I didn't mean in interviews, like not to be disingenuine, but I think you're right. You just feel like, you know, if you, if I remember getting a bronze medal at the world championships in 2015, and I, I think I said I was proud of that. And, and I wasn't deep down. I was disappointed that I hadn't gone better. Um, but, you know, you can't sort of stand on the podium and say you're not proud of that performance. I just knew I could get better. But I think what happened when I retired, it was the first time I actually had a chance to take a step back and actually look at my career and all the struggles that I had along the way. Um, you know, and, and speaking, I sat down with my coach and it was a few weeks before I announced my retirement and obviously I told him and he knew what was going on. And he said to me, he was like, I really, really look back and I don't know how we did what we did. I don't know how we achieved what we achieved together with the journey that you had. And mm. I was almost so blasé about it. And I remember not being able to put like three good weeks of training together without getting ill and getting run down. And with my condition, ulcerative colitis, it affects your immune system. So it wasn't just the struggles that I had with managing that condition. It was the fact that with that condition, I'd be so susceptible to getting run down and ill and you know when you're an athlete you're pretty vulnerable anyway because you're pushing your body so hard you know you can pick up illnesses and mm. and injuries all the time but when my immune system was already compromised and and you know I wasn't the fittest and healthiest trying to push my body to the limit every day I used to just be to be honest like teetering on the edge of getting ill every single week and it was a constant battle to just keep me in the pool and keep me healthy and that then I think all those things like I forgot I just I was so focused in always chasing the next goal chasing the next thing I didn't want to even see that because I it, in some ways to me recognizing that was like a weakness and it was almost allowing myself to believe that actually <laughs> I shouldn't be able to do this because of my body and then when I retired and obviously the way I retired it was pretty upsetting and disappointing I actually then got the perspective of oh my gosh I actually managed to achieve what I did despite all of that and actually let it soak in a little bit because I didn't really because I didn't want to I just I knew that if I did I'd start having doubts like oh could I actually do this my body is you know shot to bits <laughs> um yeah. in terms of you know like all the stress of uh the, the the physical stress the mental stress that swimming creates and and ulcerative colitis um you know, a lot of people were triggered to their colitis and, and flare ups is stress. And for me, it was stress. And so, um, you know, it, it was really difficult to manage. And I think the perspective that I got sort of after I retired, I could actually genuinely say I was so proud of myself. And especially because I was really young as well. And when I first started swimming, when I was first diagnosed with colitis, I was only 16. And, you know, I look back and think, oh my gosh, like that person, I have a bit of a dissociation with her. Like I think it's somewhat, almost someone different, but I'm so proud of the person I was back then to get through it um, and to have the mental resilience to think that although I had all these obstacles and I was dealt, you know, not ideal cards, um, I kept going and I didn't, I didn't let the idea that actually, you know, my body might not be up to it stop me you know every time I had a setback I got back in and I kept going and in order to kind of do that I had to just have that quite you know single-minded mindset so I didn't really let those thoughts creep in and then you know when I've retired I've been able to actually say wow I don't know how I got through that <laughs> and, um, and also hearing it from my coach as well um, was lovely like it, it means everything and I think that's something that's really helped me through this tough time and this tough transition was um, you know, I feel like I punched above my weight and and not everyone knows the journey. And, and that's the thing with sport is, you know, I had a difficult journey, but so many athletes have difficult journeys and that's so much the stuff you don't see. Um, mm. And I think I've always thought that I've been guilty of believing when you see people on the podium, when I was growing up and um, seeing people on the podium, I used to think, well, everything must have been completely smooth sailing for them to achieve their goals and everything just went right from sort of start to finish and then they finished on top of the podium but that's not it at all um and you know I spoke to Freya Anderson one of the swimmers who was out in 
uh, in Tokyo and, and she said that the same thing, she suffered with injuries and illness when she was growing up and she said no one really ever spoke out when she was growing up about the struggles, like you just didn't really hear about mm. it and I think that's probably one of the really great things which has come about, especially in Tokyo with people being way more open about their journeys and their struggles to kind of even stand on the podium or stand and compete at an Olympics, you know, that's allowing younger athletes and people coming through in sport to realize that it's not just smooth sailing, it's not just straight lines yeah. and that, the, that people's journeys are like this, but you just don't see it. So when it happens to you, you think this isn't normal and can I actually achieve because, you know, these are things that I, how do I know what to do? Or how do I know to push through? So I think people being open about their experiences is so helpful. Yeah, this, I spoke in a recent podcast with uh, Kath Bishop about how nice it is for, and I think I, I had done a, another episode myself on on how nice it is just hearing these athletes talk about their struggles. To be a young, I think of like if I had some of my heroes saying stuff like that, how much more um, included I probably would have felt in the, in the sport that I was growing up in, thinking that, okay, having these self-doubts, having these worries, like that's a normal part of the process. Like I'm not and dropping out of the sport wouldn't be an option the the one thing i wanted to ask you about was um you mentioned tokyo like obviously that's going to be a really tough thing for you to watch right now like being the age you're at like obviously uh you you weren't able to get there because you had to end your career but in the post that you put up about ending your career like there was a real genuine level of acceptance of of where you're at and i think if I put my own personal hat on with my journey, like that has been something I'd struggled with really hard, like to start with, like I still now have this moment of thinking like I can jump over the fence and compete and just carry on and that I could just go back into it. And then I have to have this level of acceptance. So for me, mine is being aware of those, that, that thinking and, and, and not battling it in any, any way, but how have you managed your level of acceptance of, to being, where you're at with your condition and, and having to, to pull away? I think it's it's something that I know so many athletes have struggled with because because of what you said, because you feel that when you retire, sometimes you think, do I, could I have done more? Could I have... It's the what ifs, isn't it? It's, the, it's like, it. what if? Exactly. It's the what ifs that, that hurt. And, and I think the... For me personally, I almost don't have those what ifs because for years I struggled with realizing that my body was not allowing me to do what my mind wanted me to do. Um, and when I say that, you know, I, uh, when I, yeah, when I say that like, retirement was really hard, sometimes the worst bits were actually the the times before where I was not getting what I wanted out of myself and you know I'd have a flare-up I'd be out the pool I couldn't put weeks of training back together I had a really bad flare-up in 2019 um which it completely wiped me out and to be honest you know since that point I I hadn't ever really felt like I recovered properly um which that was pro that was the hardest thing to come to terms with um and so i came to the, and it was you know months and months you know it was a couple of years where i just felt that my body was letting me down all the time um and so that's why i don't have those what ifs because it wasn't a case of thinking what if, you know, if I was to get back in the pool tomorrow, do I think, do I think I still had a chance? Not at all. <laughs> um, you know, I don't have that. And that's really sad, but I had to almost, I don't know, yeah, accept that. And it took me a long, long time. But the obviously the, the way that I retired was I, I became unwell in January. I had another flare up and it was like, there's just no way I can carry on and compete. And it was horrible and it was so disheartening, but it had been sort of flare up after flare up after flare up. And then, and then that was the position I was in. So I, I don't, I didn't have the what ifs about 
or if I got back in now, could I, could I, you know, get back to the level I want to be at? No, that's never going to happen. I think that's sort of been easy um, for me to eradicate those what ifs. But the, the what ifs that I've always had, which do sort of, you know, really eat away at me, whether what if my body wasn't as, mm. yeah, uh, like that's yeah. the thing. If I hadn't have been dealt the cards that I was when I was 16, who knows what I could have done in the sport because that was, that was like my, it was my Achilles heel, my whole career, um, my health. Um, and the time where I performed my best, I put about 12 good weeks of training together and I went like point something off the world record and came second at Olympics, nearly beat the world record holder. I was 0.3 of a second off gold. You know, I genuinely believe when I got it right, I could genuinely take on like anyone in the world. Like I was, I believe I had, without sounding like arrogant or anything, I felt like I had so much talent. And my coach always used to say, I was a bit like a, I can't remember the analogy exactly, but a bit like a, a, a racehorse where I had like so much talent, but like my my body just, I didn't have the means. Like it was, hmm. and so that's the what ifs that I struggle with is the, what if I had, you know, a, a great um, robust body that allowed me to be able to do everything that I wanted to do, you know, never miss a day of training, um, never get ill, never get run down, um, just always be on my game. Um, that's the what ifs and that that's that's been hard but that's been hard throughout my whole career I think that was stuff I had to I've had this battle in my head since I was diagnosed at 16 so it's not a case of that feeling for me after retirement it was coming to terms with the fact that eventually it got too much and my body let me down to the point where I couldn't carry on I think deep down I sort of knew that that would happen at some point um and probably earlier than I'd have liked which is a shame, it is a massive shame. But then again, when I said like what I said before, which is it gave me the perspective before I couldn't let those thoughts in as much. Like I just had to keep pushing. I had to just have this resilient mindset of, um, you know, like I can, I can still do this. Like I can conquer um, my doubts and I can, I can stand up and race the best in the world. And I've got a great work ethic. I've got the talent and just, you know, give me a good few weeks of training and I can do mm. it. And, and thankfully I, in a few times in my career, I got that consistency and, you know, performed in the way that I'd always hoped and believed I was capable of. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't smooth sailing and I, I just didn't let those doubts in. And I think the retirement gave me that perspective to think, Hey, what I achieved and how difficult it was, um, was really quite, special and it was you know it wasn't just me it was like my mum my dad my coach like they were so supportive because there were so many times where like throughout my career it wasn't just me sort of having that strong mental mindset it was my family literally picking me up and helping me through those tough times um and and also like those what ifs I think are really sort of quite pointless when I think about it because I could say what if I wasn't you know doubt those cards but then like I wouldn't change my journey for the world. Like that's the thing. And, um, you know, it, it, I feel that like I had a lot of tough lessons, but if I hadn't learned those lessons, I don't think I'd have been the swimmer that I was to win those medals. So mm. I, you know, I, I learned so much through having to be resilient and working harder than I felt like I, I had a very good work ethic and I used to absolutely push myself to the limit. And I feel like I probably wouldn't have ever pushed myself that far had I not had to do that. So yeah. that's, yeah, I, I feel like I can't think like that. It's almost an unhealthy way to think and and also pretty pointless because, you know, without sounding cliche, that, that did make me the swimmer that I was. I was tough and I was resilient and people might not think that I was tough because I always used to get ill. But I think when, you know, the people that know me knew how tough I was and how how resilient it was and how much I sort of had to really fight tooth and nail to just even stay in the pool and, and achieve those things. So it, it's yeah. really interesting. Like I have, a, I have a very similar experience. Like when I was 15, I had my first like spinal fracture and it was the first sort of crossroad I came to when my career ended. 
and it uh, could have ended sorry so it could have like completely gone all right you can't play this sport this is not going to be for you your body's just going to keep breaking but like the two years because i didn't play the sport for two years after that and then i now look back at that and go that's how i built my drive my resilience my work ethic and every time i see a young athlete now i'm i'm i always ask them like have you had an injury have you had a big setback and if they're like no i'm like damn it like r- come on we need one and and because i think that's the thing that you genuinely need something alongside it and as i'm listening to your story like you could look at yeah the setbacks and and the what ifs if i had a different body but you're right you may not have got that mentality because it would have been easier we would have been a bit more plain sailing you may not fight for it that little bit more but also now like what an inspiration you you can be in order to show people like look th- i had this and i still achieve this it's a really weird seesaw and blend because you almost feel like the people that don't have those hardships or setbacks, they they don't know yet how much they can really unearth from within themselves. But also, you, you kind of need that setback to happen. And, and I don't know whether you could... I really hope you could do it without a setback, which would be great so that people don't get hurt and people don't get injured. But... It, yeah, I, I really don't know where that one sits because it's just so tough because it's like you, you do need that setback. You do need that that thing. Whether it's someone, it might be what someone told you. There's so many athletes that have had like a, a coach at their very beginning, a teacher or a coach at the start of their careers that said, no, you couldn't do that. And then that brings this like fire in their belly and then they're bang, they're off. Or it might be just looking and being aware of when that sort of setback or someone that's doubted them has happened. and And then you the ones that tend to build that drive are the ones that have recognized what's happened and then gone, no, I'm going to choose to go the other way. I think people that maybe choose to accept those setbacks then fall into a bit of a trap and then and then go on another path. So yeah, it's a, t- it's a real tough balance, that one. Like which which way you, you want to go? Like, okay, get a setback or don't get a setback and maybe don't be as driven. I, I don't know the answer to that one at the end of the day. Yeah, no, I know. And it, it's weird, isn't it? It's... um. You know, you don't want to <laughs> wish that people go through these struggles and and you don't like I would never wish that people go through that. But it's it is what makes or I don't know that they, they these things teach you lessons which are so valuable in sport. And that's the thing which is great about athletes sort of being more open about their journey is people realizing how much can be learned from things like that. And, mm. you know, some of the the best things I ever learned were from really tough times, um, not sort of all through my colitis, but um, disappointing swims and dif- disappointing results where I, so in 2012, um, I thought that I'd missed out on the Olympic team. And uh, it, was, it was the, back then you had two different trials for the Olympics. So you had the first trials and you had the um, second trials, which are a few months later in June, but the majority of the sp- slots were filled in April. Um, for the Olympics in the summer and I remember the year before um, I was only 15 but I managed to qualify for the world championship team and yeah I was going to get on to, I was going to get on to the world championships this is a really interesting period of your time being only 15 yeah so it was it was a complete shock um, and I remember this was a really vulnerable age and a really um, influential age for me and there was a couple of lessons that I think at that point in my life I took with me throughout the remainder of my career and they were really fundamental things I learned. So the first one was that um, that time when I qualified for the world championships when I was 15. So I went to a competition and it was the second trials for the summer championships. So it was in June and I was still a junior swimmer. So I was competing at the European juniors that year. That was my big meet. And the competition, the the trials, it was just sort of a preparation competition before I went on to the Europeans. Um, and I went there and I had no expectations whatsoever. I didn't think, you know, I was going to be there or thereabouts in terms of even making a final. I got to the competition and I was in hard training and in the heat, I swam pretty well. I was swimming pretty fast. And I remember my coach, he said to me after the heat, he said, you could win this but in the heat you slowed down almost in the last 10 meters because you didn't believe you could win. Um, and he said, you're paying far too much respect to the people you're racing against just because they're older than you, just because they're you know, more experienced. And 
he said, you're almost scared to win. And I thought, hang on a sec, no, I'm not. I'm not scared to win. But I realized I probably was. And I think I just thought because I was 15, I had almost like no right to, to beat these girls, which is ridiculous when you think about it. But back then I did. I just thought, well, you know, they're older than me. They're more experienced. They're actually trying to qualify for the world's team. And I'm just here as a, as a 15 year old, um, just trying to get some racing experience. So it came to the, it came to the final, and I thought, well, I'm going to prove I'm going to prove my coach wrong. And I I swam a great race, and I actually won the event. So I got picked to swim at the World Championships, and it was such a shock. I remember my dad, my mum and dad came to every competition with me. They've been all around the world, and unfortunately, like, my dad wasn't there watching. I think they just sort of thought it wasn't you know a big deal. And and then I remember my mum calling my dad saying she's qualified for the world championships. And my dad said, sorry, what? <laughs> just like completely blown away. It was such a, you know, I never expected it in my wildest dreams. And that lesson that Dave taught me stuck with me forever. I've remembered it constantly throughout my career. And I remember some um, coaches that I used to really look up to used to say that one of the things about me that they really respected was that I just didn't fear anyone that I raced against. Um, you know, whatever they had achieved and whatever they had done in their career, I'd always get in and <laughs> absolutely give them a good race. Um, and I think that's the thing. You have to be respectful of your opponents when you're out of the pool um, and before you race. But during the race, you shouldn't give anyone like more respect. I think that's something that um, I definitely did growing up. And I see it happen so, many, so much throughout sport is you kind of almost give people um, an advantage just by respecting their achievements too much and people are beatable at the end of the day like it's sports a crazy thing I've seen you know, Olympic champions come last like not even make it through to a, a final it, it just these things happen in sport so you you can't think like that I think that that was a really sort of pivotal lesson that I learned and that sort of set me up for the next year where I had the hopes of obviously I've had the surprise of making the world championship team London 2012 was never in my expectations or my ambitions. I thought I'd be too young. I know I was only going to be 16 by the time the Olympics came around, but um, making the team in 2015 gave me the, the, the hope that maybe I could actually make the team in, in London. Um, so I sacrificed so much that year. I remember I went away on a training camp to Australia for seven weeks. I missed school for about like 10, 12 weeks of the term just before my GCSEs, just to try and qualify by going and doing every single training camp that I could. Um, you know, my mum and dad were a bit like, oh my gosh, she's missing so much school. But mm. I think they knew that if they hadn't have supported me and I'd have missed out on the team and they, I hadn't been allowed to go on these camps, I'd have always thought, what if? So it was just, they yeah. just had to let me that year. Um, and so, yeah, I came to the first trials, the Olympic trials, and it was in the Aquatic Centre in London. And it was a complete pressure cooker. I remember everyone knew how much it meant to make an Olympic team. And the atmosphere was crazy. It was so tense. Like you could hear a pin drop when ev even when the races were on, like no one was cheering or anything. It was just so tense. Everyone was sort of like, I don't know, walking around like a zombie. And um, I remember I'd never experienced that before. I never had the pressure or the nerves of trying to make a team. And I completely, absolutely <laughs> bottled it, basically. Um, I came fifth in my event um I remember on the way to the pool to race the final of the 200 medley uh you know I was so nervous I couldn't speak I just couldn't hardly even breathe um I was just so overwhelmed by that experience and I remember I was devastated then afterwards thinking oh my gosh I'm, you know I've, the dream of swimming at the Olympic Games is over and you know the, the top two girls got selected to go to the Olympics and that event was then closed off so no one else could qualify um, so I thought that was it. I thought the dream was over. And I remember I wanted to just go home after that. I wanted to just cry my eyes out and not look at a swimming pool and have to carry on the rest of the week. I kind of just wanted to go home and sulk. And I remember it was my mum and dad that said to me, um, you know, we got back to the apartment and they said, you need to, you need to carry on the rest of the week. You need to swim this meet through. You need to just get back on the horse as quickly as you can. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. I, I, I don't want to swim again. I just, I was absolutely devastated. You know, we were all crying and it was really, really hard. It was like having that hope and then it's just mm -hmm. being shattered. 
And um, they said that they were like, you know, the longer you dwell on this and the longer you sort of let it take hold of you, the worse it will be, the harder it will be to pick yourself up. So they said like tomorrow morning, you're going to go to the pool and you're going to swim. And I remember it was so painful, like so tough to do that. But it was genuinely the best lesson I could have ever learned. And I thank my parents so much for encouraging me to do that because I, as hard as it was, I didn't dwell on my loss or my disappointment. I just picked myself back up. And I had to do that, obviously, you know, as a few months later, I got diagnosed with colitis. I had to do that constantly throughout my career. Like pretty much every time I'd get ill, I'd have a setback. I just had to just basically like dust myself off, get back on the horse. And mm. I feel like I, you know, that was the first instance where it was so painful to try and do that. It just taught me so much. And I just kept doing that and doing that and doing that. And I generally feel like I owed so much of my success in my career to basically just being able to pick myself up and dust myself off and go again and um, I feel like that was where I really just learned that lesson and so that was not me that was my family and that was my mum and dad and and sometimes it is you know when people say you know when you stand up on the block it, it isn't just you or you know you go to race it isn't just you it is the people around you that shape you and help you and help you get there because for me that was so true. Yeah so let's go back to like this loads going on obviously in in that period of your of your life but going back to how you why you first started swimming in the first place like why was it what was it about swimming that that you enjoy like I personally love swimming because it's just this feeling of being connected to your body in in a yeah it's almost like being in space sometimes but like the, it, it is for me just a, such a natural thing like it being for me being out in the sea connected to nature whether it's in a pool just again that lovely feeling of shutting the world out but what got you into it from definitely like a sporting perspective to to actually get and compete and and I'd also be interested to know like you obviously got diagnosed in uh, 2012 so did you were you growing up knowing you had colitis like obviously there's like you said there's many different symptoms of it but like lots of trips to the bathroom, like fatigue, low immune system. So what was it like sort of pre-knowing and then post-knowing? But start off with why you even got into uh, into swimming in the first place. So I came from a really sporty family and well, my, my dad um, is very sporty and we're big sports fans in my household. Like we just love watching sport, love sort of taking part in sport so my dad encouraged my brother and I to just try loads of things when we were younger and um, I did gymnastics I did like, football I did tennis and my brother did all the same um, but for me like swimming was just the one that stuck and the one where I found I had the most sort of natural ability the most talent and I really struggled with confidence when I was younger um, I don't really know why because I you know I grew up in such a loving household and my mum and dad and you know the rest of my family showered me with love and I was just quite an unconfident kid and when I was at school I didn't have a great time at primary school um I didn't really make friends easily um and yeah it was just a bit of a a, a strange time I remember and I didn't have a lot of happy memories from primary school and then I remember when I found swimming it completely genuinely changed my life in a really cliche way and um, it did I gained all these new friends outside of school which at that age was so important to me and I used to get home from school and just be so excited to go swimming so I completely fell in love with it when I just started and back then I had a natural ability and I was good at swimming and I had great feel of the water but I never imagined it would be what it turned out to be. It was just the fact that it just filled me with confidence. And I was obviously, I had a little bit of a talent for it. So I'd go to competitions and I'd swim well. And I had you know, a great experience with my friends that I made through the sport. And I used to just love it. And my parents were so devoted to like, you know, ferrying me, my brother to and from every all these galas and competitions so that I could, you know, enjoy them with my friends. And that was why I fell in love with it. Um, it, it filled me with confidence that I didn't really have when I was younger. Um, and, and then, yeah, and then I feel like I, I, I started swimming properly at around the age of sort of 10, 11, like just before I went to senior school. And then when I went to senior school, I, you know, I, I felt like I'd, 
I gained so much confidence from the swimming. It really sort of did help set me up in that way to then go into um, senior school. And I had a lot better experience in senior school. And um, so I think swimming just, yeah, it, it really became my whole life from quite a young age. Um, and then in terms of colitis, so after the London 2012 trials, I then, I remember um, my coach sat me down and I was obviously devastated about thinking that I wasn't going to be competing in London. And he said, you know what, well, we've got the second trials, which are in June, July, and there is a spot still left open in the 100 breaststroke, um, which I know you'd have to drop a bit of time on your personal best, but you've got a puncher's chance at 100 breaststroke at the second trials if you want to try and you know make the team. So I thought I've got nothing to lose, everything to gain, and I just absolutely went for it. I put you know all my eggs in the breaststroke basket. I trained breaststroke constantly for months, and I mean it was a real puncher's chance. I had to drop quite a substantial amount of time in swimming, but you know I was quite fearless back then, and I just thought you know what have I got to lose, and I went for it and. And at the second trials, I swam under the qualifying time and got selected, which was unbelievable. It was such a great feeling. Um, and again, like, I don't think I'd have done that had I not had that experience of like, you know, getting back on the horse quickly. Mm. But throughout that time, um, one thing which I just, again, I look back with complete dissociation was I was suffering from undiagnosed symptoms of colitis um, for a long time. So I remember thinking, I obviously went to the world championships in 2015 and that was in Shanghai. And obviously, you know, I was eating like different food and things over there. And I came back and I remember thinking, I must have caught a tummy bug or something from China that I haven't really got over. Um, and I just didn't really know what it was. And the symptoms got progressively worse. Um, you know, it started off going to the toilet more frequently and then it got to a point where I was going to the toilet, you know, 10, 15 times a day. I was taking Imodium and still going to the toilet all the time. Um, yeah, I used to just sort of <laughs> load myself up on Imodiums and um, and painkillers, which was just, well, you know, like paracetamol and buscapan and like, you know, tummy things just to sort of try and get through the day. Um, and I look back and I just don't know how I managed to train and compete and make an Olympic team whilst I had all that going on. Um, and you meant you sorry you mentioned that that was something that you had struggled to get consistent training. Now for people that obviously may not be training in swimming, that is so important for swimmers. Like I think it was Michael Phelps come out and whether it's exacerbated or not, like you said, he had three years of never a day off because you need that amount of consistent training and you would talking about how lucky you might be to string three weeks together. So that's this is what colitis is doing to you. It's literally dragging you out of the pool to stop you from training. That's that's incredible. That's exactly that that swimming there's a lot of sports where obviously consistency is important, but I think in swimming it must be because swimming's so unnatural, you know, when you, you run or you do a sport which is on land, you're kind of almost constantly training because you're walking around and everything. Whereas swimming, yeah. you need to be in the pool so much of the time because it's an, a natural thing and you have to get the feel of the water. They used to say that if you had three days off, you were too, you were unfit. Like three days is such a huge... Wow. Difference. Yeah. So, on, land, on land, it would be probably about two weeks, like two weeks yeah. until you start seeing regression. Yeah, and it's, it's crazy because actually with COVID, we're seeing that athletes have had more time at the water and are benefiting, but still some have, some haven't. Um, it's still so, something that is really hard to understand in swimming. But the general rule is, is that, you know, time out the water is just, especially before competitions. So you can have time off and they're sort of understanding now that you can get probably fitter in a shorter space of time, but hmm. you, you couldn't have... A few days off before a competition and then race well it's just it's game over and yeah and and for me I was having time off all the time I'd you know eventually they got to a point where they would um track how much training you did and thankfully they never did that when I was so up until Rio they didn't really monitor or give you feedback of like sessions missed and stuff so I didn't ever really get to see how much time I'd had out the water um, which was good because I felt like I've, I'd have had that a graph of all the sessions I'd missed and all the 
you know, the, the work I hadn't done in the years sort of leading up to Rio, I'd have just panicked and thought, oh my gosh, there's no way I can stand up on the block. And, and they do do that now. And I think, you know, for someone like me where consistency is really difficult, I think that can kind of create a lot of doubts that actually, some like it's completely unhelpful but <laughs> um so yeah swimming is a sport that it is is really all about consistency and just being in the water as much as possible and yeah that, that was one thing which I don't know how but in the lead up to London I was battling all these undiagnosed symptoms um you know I, I couldn't sometimes I couldn't even make it to the toilet it got that bad it was really really awful um you know I'd have random joint pain which was unexplained I'd be going for scans on you know I remember I went for a knee scan not long before the Olympics um because I was getting really bad knee pain and the scan just showed that there was absolutely nothing there um it was just basically an inflammatory response to the colitis and I would, I remember another thing, like I would wake up in the morning and I couldn't see anything for like 20 minutes. <laughs> it was really quite that good thing. I couldn't drive back then. Um, but wow. I just really blurry vision. And again, that's another inflammatory response. Um, and, you know, I used to just sleep for hours. I, I remember I slept for 19 hours one weekend for all the way through. Didn't wake up oh one. Oh my God. Oh, it was wow. quite funny. I'm quite proud of it because everyone used to joke that I was a great sleeper. And um, I do pride myself on the fact that I can just sleep for Britain. Um, <laughs> yeah. And back then it was crazy. I, I remember my mum and dad, they went away. Uh, so I went to bed at 10 o'clock, I think, on Saturday night. And then my mum and dad um, were at a rugby tournament with my brother and they basically like couldn't get hold of me all day. Um, like they, they thought they panicked. But anyway, I didn't get back to about 6 p.m., and found me still in bed asleep <laughs> oh my god wow so, yeah I don't, I don't know how that happened but um i was just so fatigued so tired um and i do think like how did i do that but again you know that's one thing which has given me perspective to think wow like i was pretty tough cookie to get through that and um and then yeah so that happened but then when i got the diagnosis i think that was a really that was a completely different story i had to i got through that because it was mind over matter. I didn't think anything was wrong. I wasn't told that I had ulcerative colitis. Um, I wasn't told that I was ill. I just, you know, I just, I wanted to make the Olympic team and I was so single-minded that like, you know, I just put everything, put my you know, blood, sweat and tears into it. And I didn't think that there could be anything wrong with me, but I didn't know that there was anything wrong with me. And, um, and then when obviously I got the diagnosis afterwards, that was completely difficult and different to accept and understand. Um, and it took me probably about a year to really come to terms with it. And I struggled with acceptance. I struggled with um, learning how to cope, how to adapt. Um, I think I pretty much got away with burning the candle at both ends that year, but then trying to do that the next year because I just refused to accept it was a disaster um, and I had a really, really bad year in 2013, um, where I swam really terribly and basically overtrained and I had to then completely change my training program the year of 2014. Um, but yeah, it took me a long time to come to terms with it. And, you know, I think had I had the diagnosis before London 2012, so, you know, maybe a few, I'd gone in for the scan and the tests like a few months previous. I don't think I'd have made the team. I genuinely feel like it, it was I was quite lucky to have made the team because I just wasn't aware of what was going on. And had I yeah. had that diagnosis a few months before, it would have completely thrown me and I just would have been all over the place, you know, and what does this mean? You know, I, I think actually, if anything, it was a blessing that it was later and I was able to kind of... Um, yeah, it was mind over matter really. And I just didn't think anything was wrong. So I was going to push through regardless. And um, afterwards it did, you know, that that diagnosis did sort of hit me and it took me a long time to come to terms with it. So I was quite lucky in a way that that was the timings because it worked out that I could go to the Olympics. 
and it and it didn't sound like it didn't have a did you started off where it didn't have a label so you didn't have a label on it before and it was just this mystery and almost like okay this is just me but the thing i'm also interested in is is you've spoken about how good a relationship you've had with with your coach dave and also your parents having a big role was there really interesting from his side almost i i don't know whether you can speak for him on it but be very easy for a coach to have someone like yourself with like without sounding too bad about it like a difficult swimmer like that you're in and out of the pool like oh god we can't get her to train consistently it must have been frustrating on his end but also incredibly um i guess resilient on his end as well the fact that he stuck with you like he stuck with you all that time like he, he didn't get rid of you and didn't push you to one side that must have had a huge amount of belief from his side and also your parents which must have then instilled that belief in yourself yeah 100 percent. i you know i could almost get quite emotional talking about it because he he meant everything to me like he genuinely believed in me so much that um i was i was he says i was the most difficult summary he's ever coached and uh that's probably not just because of the clients that's probably just because of <laughs> um <laughs> You know, all the other things that all the other yeah, drama and stuff that um I probably bought but you know used to say oh I just want an easy life <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, he was he was uh he was amazing and it, it is honestly testament to how much belief he had in me and how adaptive he could be and you know if you know Dave like he he was so set in his ways with like his program and he's got an amazing program um it was amazing to see and I was so proud of him because he in Tokyo became the most decorated coach of all time mm. he hasn't just done it with me he's done it with tons of swimmers um and from from 2008 all the way through to 2020 he's had medalists he's had bronze medalists silver medalists and now gold medalists in Tom Dean and James Guy at Tokyo and it's just testament to the amazing coach he is but he always said that I was the most difficult swimmer and you know I, I, that's completely fair enough because I was and I did in some ways you know I must have made his life hell um but he just believed in me so much from such a young age you know he took a chance on me joining the program when I was really young and thankfully I like managed to prove that when I was given the opportunity I could do it and I think he just saw that talent and knew that if he could nurture it and if I could get that consistency and we could work out a way of getting that consistency, I could deliver. I had all the other ingredients. I just didn't have the right sort of mm. to, like, the right body really. Like it, that was mm. the thing that let me down. Um, and he was just absolutely fantastic. We used to have to constantly adapt things and, and make changes. And, you know, he had to, just as I had to be resilient, he had to be really resilient because sometimes his plan would get thrown out the window and he was so like, he is really set in his ways. He knows what it takes to get success. And he had to almost sometimes, you know, throw away the plan and think, oh gosh, what are we going to do now? Like the preparations ruined, like we have to adapt. We have to do it differently. Um, and he did. And if it wasn't for him having that belief in me and not just giving up on me, when it got tough, I would know when I would never have achieved anything. Um, because you know, I had all the support from my family and I had all the tools, but I needed that coach and I was so lucky that I found Dave. Um, yeah, like he, he is fantastic and he had just great ability to adapt, um, to be resilient, to work with me, even though we were always at like we always clashed heads all the time because we're both really stubborn. Um, you know, we had years like a crazy like love hate relationship everyone used to um you know sort of look at us and think oh my gosh like it's so dysfunctional because we both wanted the same thing but we were so passionate that like sometimes of course like we would you know um not agree or it would just be so hard because of the journey it, the journey was so hard it was mm. it was constantly up and down it was never smooth sailing I don't think he ever had a in the lead up to Rio, I don't think he ever had an easy week and he just said, I just want an easy life. And that was just not the case. But I feel like, you know, it was so worth it. And we are so close. Like he's, you know, he's like a second dad to me. Like, you know, now like we're, you know, thick as thieves and we're really, really close friends. And I'd say he's one of, you know, the most important people in my life. Um, but it was, yeah, a really, really difficult time. But I just 
I'm so glad that he didn't give up on me because I needed him and I couldn't have done it on my own. To get to Rio, what did you, what did you do once you'd had that diagnosis then? So he's he now knows what it is. Mm-hmm. You now know what it is. Everyone's going to understand what it is. And it's now, okay, right, there is something going on. Again, really easy to want to just put everything aside and label yourself with this condition and go, okay, well, Rio is not going to happen. or That's that's something that just not achievable, but you didn't. Um, so what, what did you do? What was the change that happened? And I know you've also spoken before about how you tracked your training and you were you were really keen on tracking your training, which I think is really important for young athletes to hear about. Um, was that a part of the process to getting to Rio? And, and was there a shift in... I guess that that mentality from Dave yourself and the relationship you had there along with having a bit more of a structure around how to get there yeah yeah um definitely I had to I had to just adapt and it took me a long time to learn about my body and what works and what didn't work um Mm. and I feel like that four years gave me a good amount of time to be able to make mistakes and learn from them. Uh, so in 2013, so the year after I was diagnosed, I basically pretended nothing had happened um, and just tried to carry on burning the candle at both ends and pushing my body to the absolute limit, never changing anything in my program, um, not getting enough rest, not getting enough recovery. And just, yeah, it, it proved to be an absolute disaster at the World Championships in 2013. I sound terribly. Um, I used to get to the end of every race and basically like pass out and be sick. I was completely overtrained. Um, and the next year after that, we stripped it completely back. I went from doing 70 kilometers a week to about 50, which at my age was like unheard of. Like for me to sort of drop that much in volume was completely unheard of and it was a big risk. Um, because you know in swimming it's sort of basically how much can you handle in training and not break and then you'll swim well (laughs) that's like the sort of mentality it's very um it's about pushing yourself a lot and and it's changing now I've seen it change so much a lot of swimmers are doing different programs and doing a lot less and you know there's USRPT and all these different methods of training which are being evolved and um people are are using now which have been proved to work fantastically well but where I swam and Dave's program and what has worked for him over the years is a pretty brutal hard training program it's about training smart not hard but like just basically trying to get you know push yourself crazy um and so I yeah I dropped a huge amount in volume and I trained with like some of the sprinters and some of the older guys in my squad who were obviously older and couldn't handle the volume. And that proved to be a huge benefit. I was able to get through the week so much better. I mean, it was, I don't know how much percent of a drop that is, but it's quite a big percentage drop in loads. Um, and it just meant I, I was able to actually perform in the sessions rather than just get through them and survive. Um, and so that made a massive difference. I also found that, um, you know, I, I really struggled with traveling anywhere where I'd have to travel. It just took it out of me like crazy. It would either be because, you know, the change in food, the change in water, it could sometimes like bring on symptoms or it's like flight. And I needed so much rest and recovery to be able to stay fit and healthy in the pool. So if I went away, had jet lag or something and I came back, I'd just probably likely get ill. And that would mean like a week out the pool. And sometimes we would not I would not go away on trips and I'd pull out of trips which I also always got pushed back from you know with you know the governing body and stuff because people didn't understand um I would you know I'd say like this is just for me personally like this is just not the best way to get the best out of myself or it's not the way that I'm going to perform and I know it might work for everyone else but unfortunately for me if I go away I can you know some of this competition and great like I'll get racing experience but it's not worth it when I can race locally and then I don't have to interrupt like you know my sleeping and I don't have to then potentially get ill because I would always always get ill um so things like that which took a while to learn but it did really really help and it was always hard having those conversations but 
I'm really glad that I did and I sort of stayed true to what I believed was best for me and the biggest thing was like not comparing myself to everyone else and I did that mm. for years and I really struggled with thinking why can't I just be able to be as resilient and robust as them like why can't I go away and do these competitions and you know sometimes it was like going away and doing competitions where you get good prize money and I'd have to pull out and one of these things where I would always just think oh gosh like this is really annoying but I always had to think big picture and what am I what's my goal where am I trying to be and what's going to help me get there and what's best for my journey and my preparation and I'm really glad that although sometimes there was pushback I did the thing that was best for me and didn't compare to other people because as athletes are really guilty of doing that as well and what's best for you might not be best for another person and that was one lesson I learned massively and that helped me so much um and then yeah one thing which really helped me in the lead up to Rio was planning um or using a training tracker and I sat down with my psychologist you know almost like two years out from Rio when we started working together really closely and he worked for at the time he worked for chimp management and I got to understand all about psychology and how the brain works and how when you come into a major competition you're going to have so many nerves and doubts and all of these things like flying around your head which aren't completely natural and it's your body's way of obviously trying to keep you in a comfort zone and it was trying to work out what my doubts and like what my chimp would be like going into Rio and how best to manage that and how I could prepare for those thoughts and feelings and and for me the biggest doubt because of my journey was that I hadn't done enough and I hadn't been able to basically get the preparation that I needed to stand up on the block and perform because that was always the thing that I was struggling with so I sat down with Rich and we worked out that if I could have a training planner and I could basically map out my sessions and at you know, when I got to Rio and I stood up on the block, I could look back at all of the work I'd done with a really unbiased view, not so I could let my head and my chimp hijack me saying, you haven't done enough, you haven't done this, you haven't done that. I could look back and look at, you know, objectively all the work I'd done. And for me, it wasn't, oh, I've done 70K that week and 60K and it wasn't about volumes and it wasn't about um, times or anything. It was my effort and my intensity and that there were five different goals mm. I had to achieve every day. And it was, did I turn up with the right attitude? Did I turn up with, um, you know, the, and give my all to that session and whatever the aim was for that session, whether it was in a recovery session, did I, did I get to the recovery session and do the best I could at that recovery session? And that could just be swimming easy for like 45 minutes, but did I do that to the best of my ability? And then, you know, and then it could be a hard session. Did I do that hard session to the best of my ability? And that doesn't mean swimming fast times because when you're an athlete, that never happens every day. Like you can't just always perform every day, but as long as you give your best effort, that's all that you can do. And another one was about my relationship with Dave. And I think there was just a, about five different things that I scored myself like red, amber, green, but none of them were, you know, times or um, volume. Yeah. Outcome, outcome based things. Exactly, exactly. So, and it, then I had this spreadsheet, which I could look back on and it was like green, 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 green. And that then gave me the belief when I got to Rio, the biggest competition in my life where I had tons and tons of doubts. You know, I had some of my personal best time in two years, which at my age is a big thing. Um, you know, I swam really well in 2014 at the Commonwealth Games, but at that, you know, then the next year in 2015, I didn't have a good year. Um, I mean, I, I had an okay year, but I didn't perform the way I wanted to. I didn't some personal best. Um, and, you know, I'd had, a, I'd, I'd had a difficult year with other things going on. So it was, you know, going into Rio, I, I didn't have tons of confidence and I'd had a really bumpy journey. And I just basically had that tool, that training map, which I could look back and think, well, actually I've done absolutely everything that I can do. I've recovered well. I've trained to the best of my ability. I've left no stone and turned. And then when I step on, stand up on the block, whatever happens, happens. And that sport and, and it just, yeah, it alleviated so many doubts. It silenced my chimp. And, um, you know, obviously I was still nervous in the cool room and when I was there and, you know, I still have butterflies and all those sort of things, but I just knew that I'd done everything I can. And that was the best preparation I could have had. Yeah, for people that are listening that don't know the whole chimp analogy, like that's from uh, Dr. Steve Peters, Chimp, Man Chimp Paradox, 
book, which I've actually recommended in a previous podcast about. It's one of the four books I recommend for for athletes. But um, so you definitely felt that helped, and you're standing at the top on the blocks at Rio. You're about to to jump in for your swim, and how did that then feel in the swim? Because if people watch that race, like you're literally the last five ten meters, you nearly had it. Like, and it was <laughs> such a cool race. Uh, you nearly had the next. You had the nearly had the goal, but it was a, an amazing swim. And did it feel as good as it looked? Um, be, and do you feel that that was due down to all of that preparation and that mental prep, rather than the fit? Because you said there, the physical stuff was not necessarily there in the sense that you've had the consistency in the pool, you've had as much training as everyone else. And this is something I'm fascinated with, with elite athletes, because I genuinely believe like it is your mindset that is that d- defining factor. And this is a such a good story and almost case study to, to show that you don't need all that training. You don't need to overtrain because I did that. I've, I've overtrained, but the mindset, you standing at the top of those blocks on at Rio, that's a completely different feel from what you're saying. And then did it feel in the race, easy, tough? Um, yeah, what was that whole in the pool moment feeling like? In the pool, I remember when I touched the wall, um, I just c- couldn't believe that I'd swam that time. I never ever believed that I could go 206. Um, you know, 206 in, in swimming in my event is almost like completely uncharted territory. The only girl that um, was been one girl and it was the girl who beat me has gone faster mm. and she holds a world record. But before that, there was only one girl who was in a shiny suit. And, you know, even in Tokyo, just gone, I think it was still two seconds faster than the time that won gold. Like it's, it's a time I just never believed I was capable of. Um, and yeah, so I touched the wall and I turned around and I thought, oh my gosh how have I swam that time and then I realized how close I got to gold and I just couldn't believe it you know it was quite bittersweet going into it a medal would have was my goal like that was my goal was to stand on the podium you know the girl that beat me Katin Kazu she was world record holder um she was on fire she broke the world record in the 400 meters in uh, in Rio a few days before absolutely smashed the world record you know she'd been going and winning races all around the world like she you know that gold medal um going into it I thought it was gonna be a big challenge to beat her she was two seconds clear of me so for me to drop down to the 206 and get so close to her I couldn't believe it and then it was obviously almost bittersweet because I thought oh gosh I was so close to gold but I couldn't think like that because for me that silver medal was my gold medal um and the race I remember thinking afterwards it didn't hurt at all like I remember just being like I think the adrenaline and then the excitement and just the, the rush of emotions, I didn't feel the pain, but then I went and had my lactate taken. And I think it's quite funny because it was a lactate PB. So it was like 20 or something. Yeah. I've never been <laughs> near that. So I was obviously like, my body was in agony, but I just couldn't feel it because of all the excitement. So um, I think, you know, they do say that when you perform it like that, it feels like an out of body experience. And I think that's what it was because it felt so surreal when I touched the wall. I can imagine if I'd swam that time and it had been a disappointment, it would have hurt. I don't know. I don't really know how the mind and all that sort of thing works with adrenaline or whatever. But um, yeah, it it was a pretty special feeling. And, you know, it's so true. I, I never had an easy ride and I never had um, smooth sailing in terms of preparation. And I managed to get a few weeks of consistent training, but even at the trials in April, only a few months before the games, I'd swam pretty poorly and um, I just made the team. I just swam under the qualifying time. I went at 2.09, which was then three seconds slower than what I went in Rio. Um, you know, and, and I had articles that were written. Um, there was an article I remember vividly. It was ri- written about um, me and my teammate Jazz, because um, we'd both won medals at the World Championships in Kazan the year before. and our next big competition was the trials in April and we'd both basically scraped onto the team. Like we just made the team and we didn't really perform very well. And the article basically slated our chances in Rio saying, you know, they didn't swim very well at the trials. It sort of looks like this season's all over for them really. And I remember reading it and being absolutely livid. Like it just made my blood boil. And, um, and I think 
that was again like something which if I'd have paid too much attention to that let it get the better of me it was all about you know mindset and I just didn't believe that I couldn't do it I, I was I, I believed I could do it if I could get everything right and I could get into a place where you know I believed I could do it then why couldn't I um mm. and and yeah and I just I found ways of alleviating those doubts and found tools and things that would help me like that training tool um you know and I had my coach who we constantly adapted we made changes we you know again like just before the Olympics I, I didn't go away on a tra- on a camp or I didn't go away on a, to a competition which was in France I chose to go just up the road to Glasgow and compete rather than travel and go away um things that you know I, I made changes I made things work for me so that I could stay in the pool stay fit stay healthy um you know even at the I think it was one of the last competitions I did before before uh, before Rio I I got injured and I had to pull out and I saw him absolutely terribly. It was at the Menostrums in Barcelona. I remember it was about a month before Rio and um, I had a wrist injury. It was like playing me up a little bit and, and I was swimming pretty poorly. And I remember thinking, I'm actually quite glad that my wrist is hurting and I'm having to pull out because I don't want people to see these times that are posted because they were that bad. And, you know, that that's just the ups and downs of sports. I was obviously in really, really hard training and I was so knackered, like so, so tired that I'd sort of, you know, you go through like an adaptation phase. And then um, mm. Dave, my coach, is quite sort of famous at like putting people in these real sort of training holes where you're absolutely depleted. And then when you taper and when you rest, you just go like that and your body just like comes alive. And it's, it's amazing. I don't, it's crazy how it works because you go from feeling like you're so tired, you could barely swim another meter. And then when you race, you swim absolutely terribly. But then when you rest and you sharpen up and you go through taper and you go through adaptation, your body just like responds to all mm. the hard work you've done. And again, you have to be mentally strong to get through that. You have to like not pay attention to the bad times of swimming and think that actually this is all part of the process. For me, it was just all part of the process. And I knew that I had to train really, really hard if I wanted to get to do better than I've ever done you know if I wanted to swim a PV I had to train harder than I ever have before um and yeah and so I was I was um yeah definitely mentally strong definitely well prepared mentally I'd learned tough lessons from sort of the previous four years and yeah I felt so well prepared when I stood up on the block in in Rio and you know it paid off <laughs> but you know it wasn't like I sort of went in with tons of confidence I didn't at all um so it is a great I guess lesson to like younger athletes because it's not you know you you can perform and outperform and surprise yourself and have these amazing results if you just believe in yourself and you get the best out of yourself by trusting the process and also believing in the people that you work with like your coach you know your family you, you sort of people around you to help you and support you through the tough times but also, yeah, believing in yourself and believing that you can do it and finding ways that you can alleviate those doubts that work for you. Yeah, trust in the process. Your story is is really like one that I really will push people to listen to because of the fact that everyone focuses so much on the training, like you said, especially in a sport like you, getting in the pool, doing a ton of training, constantly hitting lap after lap after lap. And then for someone to pull, take that down, reduce that training, find a place where you feel comfortable and believe in yourself so much and then still perform on the biggest stage that is such a big lesson for people to learn and like I even think of myself being a young athlete I fell into that trap of like overtraining thinking like if I have that day off it's not gonna uh, work and that trust that you had in the training to taper and then bang you're you're well again that takes a lot of trust in that I think swimming and and I think long distance running has that as well where it's those taper periods and 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 olympic sports in general have that taper period um but it's just such a great story for people to hear like that you don't have to or or to focus on putting yourself into a confident frame of mind is so important it is so so important for people to do i'm conscious of time like we've gone on for ages and i and i 
I think there were so many things I was asking you, which you've aren't going to ask you, which you've answered around sort of your toughest moments, your overcoming adversities, and it's just full of it in your story. But one thing I I always believe in that underpins us as athletes is who we are as people, and I wondered whether there were some values or attributes that you feel you've lived by that have allowed you to to be not only a, a good person but a great athlete as well um i don't know <laughs> that's a good question that's a really good question um i think one thing that you know is so important as an athlete is to like never let this is a cliche saying but i've just thought it's so true never let success go to your head and then failure go to your heart like i just think if you in both ways they can be bad <laughs> you know um it's sport is an amazing thing and i am such a huge sports fan i love the way it enriches people's lives across like every level of participation but at the end of the day it is just sport and you know when i was a swimmer i'd get so wrapped up in it but at the end of the day it's just swimming and it's something that i love to do when i was little and i've been lucky that i could take it all around the world and like experience all these amazing things as being an athlete but at the end of the day it's just swimming and it's something that i choose to do and it's you know it shouldn't define me i have sometimes feel like i've let it define me which it shouldn't but um you know when it when you strip everything away it's actually like getting in a big tank of water and trying to get from like one side of the other to that to the other and i just think it's just it's just a fun thing to do and it's not anything more than that and um what matters is what people think of you when all of that is stripped away and and you know who, yeah who you are as a person I, I just always thought like the two things that you can control you like when you walk into a room is that you can be the kindest and the most hardworking. and other than that you can't really control anything else um so yeah I just always tried to you know work my socks off and try and make the most of the opportunities that were delivered to me but never treat anyone as any any differently like that I think that's mm. you know that, yeah that <laughs> that's not a very good way of putting it but um, no it was I mean it's incredible it's so 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 true and I think you also mentioned it earlier about having the cards you've been dealt and and just playing anyway that's something that is yeah I think people can get so wrapped up in that like they can get so wrapped up in like woe is me what i have like and lean on and, and use it as a crutch mm -hmm. um the paralympics is a great example of people that don't allow that to happen mm -hmm. and they choose you have the choice of which way you go with things and you chose to even after your diagnosis you chose to continue and that's again all of these little choices that we have are, are just are just massive you is there just before we finish wrap up is there a a book, a um, film documentary that you have felt you love and recommend to people a lot that, and especially athletes that may have an impact um, in, in their world? Um, that's a really great question. Um, I've read, I've read quite a few books that I really like. Um, one, which is quite, quite interesting to read which I, I absolutely loved um was Andre Agassi open I, I loved reading that I, yeah. I think when I read that it just completely yeah blew my mind and I I would love the opportunity to meet him I just think I'd love to ask him things mm. like he's just yeah that book for me was one of the best autobiographies I've ever read from someone in sport um because it was just so open I mean it says it in the title um, and that really stuck with me, that book. Um, in terms of, you know, people that you just spoke about the Paralympics and someone I think, you know, if to look at their story, Ali Jawad, he's a um, Paralympian weightlifter um, and he was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and he is so inspiring. I think, you know, about a year ago, um, he was at a crossroads between, you know, being told that he might not even compete and like whether he could even get to the Paralympics and he's there competing now and like 
his story is just unbelievable and he's so strong and just such a lovely person and um you know one of the things about Clytus is by him sharing his experience like I feel better about talking about mine and like when I hear him speak it gives me strength and I think that's one of the nice things about the Crohn's and Clytus community is what he's doing is helping so many people by speaking about his experience um mm. and he's just amazing I, honestly I just yeah um he's a huge inspiration to me um in terms of books I mean yeah I don't know that Andre Agassi is probably one of the I mean open is a open is a book that I've recommended on this podcast for it is okay. incredible book <laughs> it's it's for sure it's one that I, you're so right. I'd love to meet him, chat with him, because I think the way he spoke about his career is just exactly the, the title is just so perfect. Yeah, like he just nailed it. Um, Completely agree. And obviously now, where you're finished, where you're done, and you're finished with training, and and your well being is is a big part of the reason why you finished. Is what do you? there's going to be so many things with gut health around the world right now. And that is a completely huge rabbit hole to fall down when you go down that road. It, what are the things that you're doing to to look after yourself now? What are the things you're excited about moving forward? So sort of what's the future future looking like for Siobhan? So a good question. So, I mean, I'm doing so much better than I was. Like it's, it's really opened my eyes, not swimming. I'm not pushing my body to the absolute limit um hmm. has I just feel so much better and given my body that rest but I'm, I was almost quite surprised at the fact that like I you know I look back and I think how did I get through a week of training because you know even now I'm I'm nowhere near as energetic as I feel like I should be for someone my age like I I just need so much sleep I need so much rest and recovery and I have to eat right and like all these things which you know I just have to do is having that my condition and it does have quite a, a big toll when I have bad days in my tummy and I think well how did I swim four hours a day and you know wake up early in the morning and like drive myself to the pool and like so one of the things obviously about retirement is I've given my body the rest that it needs which is which is really good um and I'm starting to feel better from it now but it's t- it took me a long time I'd say like only probably recently where I felt that I've actually started to feel a bit more back to normal um like and it's yeah so it's, it's been a journey I'm just trying to find my feet with not swimming anymore and you know what that's like and um trying to find exercise I enjoy um because I've had this love hate relationship with exercise for a long time um and I need to obviously try and get into the mindset of not feeling that you know, when I go to the gym or anything, I have to be doing like the training that I used to be. Yeah. Doing. It's a hard transition to make because I've I've felt that it's it's trying you like you feel you like you have to be regimented. There's a goal to hit, and it's the difference of training for health and well being compared to training for pure performance and like eating as well. Like that I get caught in the trap sometimes of like eating for fuel. And I think as well, like men for some reason we have this huge like macho or I'm gonna have the biggest steak the biggest breakfast and like i just eat and eat and eat and it's like yeah i'm a hero watch me roar um but now it's like well how do i feel am i energized all my markers are sort of on how am i feeling am i feeling energized my it has my sleep like am i compromising my sleep and usually the answer being yes but yeah that's the that's the thing that i think is a real tough one to change when you go to be like what am I doing? What am I doing with my training? Like, what's my goal? What's my- how am I resetting my goal? So, I think it's this it is a tough challenge for for athletes that do come out out of their sport to rejig their training and find what works for them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I'm kind of going through that now, and I just want to find something I enjoy mm. with exercise, and then also with you know work and stuff. And I have been studying to be a journalist so that's really cool and I'm enjoying that I started that um about 18 months ago now and it was because I sort of thought well what would I what would I like to do when I finished swimming and obviously I finished earlier than I would have liked but I'm quite glad I started that when I did um so yeah I'm starting um to sort of try and you know venture into the commercial world of sport which 
mm. is if you know if, if it works out that's like the dream job for me being involved with sport but um obviously not on the performance side I'd absolutely love that and um you know I've always been a huge sports fan and I like writing and I think sports journalism is where I'd like to to go um so I'm hoping that you know opportunities arise in that and I just want to find something I enjoy again and I can throw myself into you know swimming okay it was tough and it was you know a, a, a difficult at times I absolutely loved it and it gave me so many amazing experiences um which I'm so grateful for and I just want to find something that I enjoy again and I think that's that's yeah I, I, I need something that I can put all my energy into in a different way that I don't now put into swimming so no doubt with your mentality of mind over matter like that's not going to be too long before you start getting into something that is really going to shine um look Siobhan thank you so much for for time it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you and and meeting you and and having this this conversation uh where where is the best place for people to find you if they want to reach out follow more of what you're doing uh best place um probably twitter instagram um i don't really yeah i don't have a facebook page really um just twitter instagram um or you know email i've got an email on my instagram bio so yeah um if you would like to get in touch i'd love to hear from people so yeah that's probably the best way to find me the story so inspiring and, uh, and no doubt people that have whether they have ulcerative colitis or any other condition it's just something that i think people again with more athletes talking about their experiences but yours is a real unique one and and the stories that you've you've told and the lessons you've learned from it people can transfer into a load of different things that they're they're going through themselves so thank you for sharing it from from starters but um it's been an absolute uh, pleasure chatting for this this podcast episode yeah thanks so it's been a pleasure talking to you too i've really enjoyed it and thank you very much for having me on